Oh, okay, yes. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our volunteer talk tonight. Um, this is our fourth volunteer talk now, um, and these talks are exclusively for our wonderful Royal Parks volunteers. Um, so thank you very much for signing in today for this exciting talk. I'm Rachel, I'm the volunteer officer, but I am here to introduce um, Charlie Linton, who is the learning assistant for our Mission Invertebrate project. And the Royal Parks Mission Invertebrate project is all about improving the parks for invertebrates by creating new habitat for them and things like that, but also educating oops, educating people about these really amazing creatures, which is partly what we're here today to do. So before we start, I've just got a few quick housekeeping things to cover um, and then we'll get onto the talk. So um, my, if you've not used Microsoft Teams before, if you want to send in any questions and we really encourage you to send some questions in, um, during the talk, uh, you can click on the little speech bubbles up that should be at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on what device you're using. And that will give you a box where you can send us any questions and um, they then come to us and we can publish them. And any questions that you've published, um, if you can view the questions of, you can view the list of all the questions that have been sent in. And these will, um, and you can like any questions that you um, are particularly keen on, and then we will ask answer those questions first at the end basically so you can kind of vote for which questions if somebody's asked the question you were going to ask you can vote for having that question answered um, but if you have any technical problems you can also send those to us through the chat and we won't publish them but we can answer them privately for you um, the teams also allows you to pause and rewind the talk so if you've come in a bit late or you need to go away and do something and come back um, there's a pause button and it will be just like a normal internet video at the bottom you can um, rewind back to the start but if you want to go back to what's live you can click on um, the um, there's a button that says live along the bottom of your screen and that will jump you back to where we are um, you can also come back to the video um, after it's finished and rewatch it on here, but we will be recording it and we will also send out a link to it on YouTube later on if you'd prefer it to watch it that way. Um, yeah, so again, if you have any technical issues during the talk um, that you can access the chat for, send them in to us that way. Or if you have been kicked out of the talk for some reason or you're having technical issues outside of the talk, you can email volunteering at royalparks.org.uk and I'll be keeping an eye on that throughout the talk as well. Um, but without further ado, sorry, I think my microphone keeps going slightly wrong, but I'm getting off the mic in a second. Without further ado, we I would like to introduce Charlie and his talk on hoverflies, which I'm really excited to hear about. Let me just get that sorted. OK. And. OK, Charlie, you're on. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for joining this evening and for this short introduction to hoverflies. Uh, my name is Charlie and I work for the Royal Parks on a project called Mission Invertebrates and we help people to discover, celebrate and protect the important invertebrates who call London's Royal Parks home. So we do lots of things at Mission Invertebrates, um, one of them being our programme of adult events. Um, so usually we would be running lots of adult events, which range from uh, lots of sciencey things, such as our moth morning, um, helping people, to, teaching people about moths and finding these um, invertebrates up close. We also do more creative things, such as um, invertebrate life drawing sessions or photographing invertebrates. We do a lot of surveys across all the parks, and we use uh, lots of volunteers for these surveys. Um, helping us to understand the invertebrates that live in the parks and the habitats that, that they need um, to be able to survive and lay their eggs, etc. And all the data that we collect from these surveys then gets passed on to our park managers and it helps us to help influence um, park management, park man management projects across the parks. So this um, digger that you can see here is um, doing some read Reed bed management in Regent's Park. But the side of the Mission Invertebrate project that I work on is the learning side. So often we would have um, schools that come to visit us in the Lookout Education Centre in the middle of Hyde Park. 
and we run a series of um, interactive school sessions in the parks. But we also can go out to schools um, to run assemblies all about inverters. And then we've got our series of roadshow events. So these are family events in the school holidays. Uh, we go around with our bug and bill. There's lots of us in that photo, but um, last year we were doing everything, creating lots of YouTube videos. Uh, but we're hoping to start our roadshow again up soon. Uh, we do lots of craft activities, there's storytelling and uh, lots of bug hunts as well. So before starting with Mission Versprit, um, so I studied biology at the University of Sussex uh, with a focus on pollinators. And the University of Sussex has a great pollinator team uh, with Dave Goulson, who some of you may have come across. He's often on Radio 4 and he's written a, a lot of books, uh, which I highly recommend. He also started a, a community a citizen science project, uh, like a club of citizen science projects called the Buzz Club um, to encourage people to make their gardens wilder and better for pollinators. And while I was there, I helped to create, to create the, to start the um, Hoverfly Lagoons project, which I'll talk more about later in this, um, in this talk. But I remember even as a child being taught about hoverflies, being taught that they're completely harmless to humans. Um, and someone showed me that you can, um, if you see a hoverfly hovering sort of around head height, you can very gently put your hand underneath the hoverfly. And sometimes if you're lucky, um, the hoverfly will come and just perch on your finger for a second, which is quite a nice connection to nature to have. So I've always loved uh, invertebrates and hoverflies are very um, like wonderful creatures. So hoverflies are invertebrates, so that's any animal which doesn't have a backbone. And hoverflies belong to an order of insects called the true flies. And the scientific name for true flies is Diptera, di meaning two, and terra meaning wings. And insects typically have four wings, um, such as bees and butterflies and dragonflies. They've all got four wings, but sometimes it's a bit harder to see um, see all of their wings. So beetles, for example, their front wings have evolved into a hard wing casing, so they don't look like your typical wings. And ants, um, ants generally, we see them, they don't have any wings because they're sort of living underground, uh, but they do, as a species, they do have four wings with, with the queens and males having four wings. With um, the true flies, they've got two wings, one pair of wings, and they've also got um, their hind wings have evolved into these very small sensory organs called haltiers. And these haltiers help the fly to know sort of which way is up and down. It acts a bit like a gyroscope, um, helping the fly to balance and be steady while it's flying. The true flies have um, very large eyes, these large compound eyes, um, which take up most of their head. And in the, the, in the hoverflies, you can tell the difference between a male and a female hoverfly by looking at the eyes. So this one here is a female hoverfly. Females tend to have smaller eyes with a gap in between, whereas male flies will have much larger eyes and they sort of touch and meet in the middle. And males have larger eyes because they're sort of on the lookout for females to find a mate. So we've got um, over 7,000 species of fly recorded in the UK and about 280 of those species are hoverflies. So hoverflies um, they're a nice sort of gateway into the world of flies because they are important pollinators. Um, so they're often living around flowers and they're very colourful as well. So they're quite large and this is quite nice to study pollinators because you're out on a sunny day looking at flowers rather than other species of fly when, you're, when you'd be sort of looking through a sort of dead animal to find them. Um, so they're quite a nice species of fly to study. 
And then you have that characteristic hovering behavior. And you can often see them on a sunny day, so sort of, especially in woodland glades, um, catching the light on their wings. And no one really knows for sure why hoverflies hover. Um, it's likely be, because it can seem like a, a bit of a waste of energy to spend a lot of time sort of staying in one spot hovering in midair. Um, it's likely because um, if they're in the air, then they can see almost all the way around them and they can spot any predators coming from any direction. And also it means that they're able to move away in any direction. So if they see a predator coming, it can zip away quickly in any direction. Whereas if they were sitting on a leaf, um, then they wouldn't see anything coming from below and there might be tall vegetation hiding in their view. There are um, a couple of things to look out for um, on the wings of a hoverfly if, um, if you get the chance. I realise when they're hovering, you can't really look at their wings, but um, if they're basking in the sun with their wings open, um, do take a look because there are a couple of features which are distinctive for hoverflies and it can help you tell the difference between a hoverfly or a fly or a bee. So there's this um, letter A on this diagram shows a, a false wing margin and this is a couple of uh, veins which run parallel to the true edge of the wing. Um, so it creates sort of this false edge. And this is this is present in almost all hoverflies in the UK. Uh, there are a couple of other species of fly which do also have this, but most hoverflies have this. And then you've got um, this floating wing vein shown as B. And this isn't actually a vein, this is a fold in the, in the wings, but this is unique to the hoverflies. There's only, I think, one species of fly of hoverfly in the UK, which doesn't have this floating wing vein. But if you can see this, um, this floating vein, which comes down and then sort of doesn't join onto anything, it just sort of um, comes to an end before reaching any of the other, any of the other veins. Um, if you can see that present, then you know that you're looking at a hoverfly. And then as I said, hoverflies are often very colorful as well. Um, so they're quite, they have quite distinctive patterns and they're excellent at mimicry. So bees and wasps have got that classic black and yellow stripy body um, as a warning signal to any predators to tell them that they'll sting them if they feel threatened. And this is called aposomatic coloration. It's just basically warning anything, uh, any predators to tell them that you're, taste, that you're, you're distasteful um, or that you're be painful to eat. And hoverflies take advantage of this. Um, so they have very similar coloration and very similar patterns to um, deter predators. And this is called Batesian mimicry. It's basically trying to look scarier than you actually are. And so many hoverflies uh, will emerge as adults slightly later in the year than the bees and wasps that they're trying to mimic. So the peak time to find hoverflies flying is um, in the late summer, sort of July or August time, um, slightly after when bees are at their peak. And because they are amazing mimics, um, I thought we could play a little game of hoverfly or not a fly. So I'm going to show you some images on the screen. And if you think this is a hoverfly, then you can put hoverfly or the letter H in the chat box. Or if you think it's a bee or a wasp, then put not a fly or the letter N in the chat box. So this is our first one. Yes, yeah, so just pop your questions in the chat, pop your answers in the chat box, everyone, and I will let Charlie know what people have sent through. Although we'll have to wait for about 10 seconds because we broadcast on a 10 second delay using this platform. So, uh, but I'll let Charlie know as soon as these start coming through.
You can also have a look at the eyes to tell if, um, to have a look at whether it might be a male or a female overfly. And if you want, you could just play along in your head as well. OK, so we're starting to get answers through. Who reckon it's a hoverfly? Great. Yes, this is a hoverfly. This is a hoverfly called the Batman hoverfly. Um, and it's called this because it's got on the thorax, so that section just below the head, um, it's got that almost bat, uh, Batman symbol. But yeah, we can tell it's a hoverfly because it's got very large eyes that take up most of its head. Um, and you might just be able to make out that uh, false wing margin on its wings as well. Brilliant. So how about this one? Um, if you think it's a hoverfly, put the letter H in the chat box. Or if you think it's a bee or a wasp, then put the letter N in the chat box. I know this one, but I won't spoil it yet. I want to talk more about the image, but I can't give too much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's the downside of the delay on Teams is we have to wait for the audience to catch up. Oh, OK, we're starting to get answers in. They think it's not a hoverfly. Very good, CAS. This is a bumblebee. This is a white tailed bumblebee. And you can see that it's got, uh, you might be able to make out that it's got four wings. Sometimes with bees, uh, their wings can be sort of folded over each other. So it can be a bit difficult to tell that they've got four wings. It might look like two, but um, you can see that this bumblebee has got four wings. It's got long antennae as well. Um, hoverflies tend to have much shorter antennae than bees and wasps. Um, but this bumblebee mimic um, hoverfly on the right is very cleverly looking like um, this bumblebee. Like next door to each other, there's lots of differences that you can spot, but um, it's got all the coloration in the same sort of areas. It's got that white tail and then that orange yellow stripe in the middle, and then a bit of orange at, at the head as well. But very good. Uh, we've got this one. So again, if you think it's a hoverfly, put H uh, in the comments. If you think it's not a fly, put the letter N. This one has beautiful colours. Yeah, I'm not sure I know this one. <laughs> I have a guess, but I won't say until other people have had a chance. I don't want to skew anybody's answers. OK, I don't know whether people aren't sure about this one because they're taking longer to answer. Um, sure, I can <laughs> move that. I would guess, I'm going to give my own guess, that it is a hoverfly. Very good, yeah, this is a hoverfly. <laughs> uh, this is a hornet mimic hoverfly. Um, and this is the largest species of fly that we get in the UK. They're about um, two centimetres to 2.5 centimetres long. Um, and they mimic this Eurasian hornet. Um, again, side by side, you can definitely tell there's differences, but um, you can see that this hornet mimic hoverfly um, has very large eyes. Uh, this one is a male because the eyes meet in the middle up there. Um, and you can see that it's got two wings. Um, this hornet, you can see it has four wings. Um, but yes, the hornet mimic hoverfly is one of my favourites. I might just um, quickly skip through this uh, last one, but um, this one, um, 
So this one is a drone hoverfly, and it looks is uh, mimicking a male honeybee. But again, you can see it's got very large eyes uh, and short antennae. The honeybee has larger antennae, and it's got um, yeah, two wings. So the wings and the eyes are the sort of main features to look for, um, to look at when you're looking at um, a potential hoverfly. So um, hoverflies have, um, there are over 280 species, so there's lots of diversity in where a hoverfly will live and where it will lay its eggs and which flowers it will visit as well. Uh, but all hoverflies have got a four stage life cycle. You get, uh, you'll have a female adult hoverfly who lays her eggs uh, in a variety of different habitats. Out of the eggs will hatch the, the larvae and fly larvae are called maggots, tend to be called maggots. Um, and the larvae or the maggots will eat lots and lots of food and grow bigger and bigger. And when they grow, um, when they're ready, when they've grown really big and got a lot of energy, they'll then turn into a pupa. So the outer skin will harden and um, form a shell, a pupal shell. And inside that shell, um, the body will go through a complete metamorphosis and turn into an adult. And then the adult will, or the pupil case will split open and the adult will crawl out and emerge. So hoverflies will use a number of different habitats to do this. Um, some of them will lay their eggs around rotting, vegeta uh, around rotting wood um, and the larvae will eat some of that wood and help to break it down and recycle all those nutrients. You get some hoverflies which live in living plant tissue. Um, thistles are a particularly uh, good egg laying spot for lots of hoverflies and you'll get the larvae living inside the stem, eating the stem from the inside or living around the roots as well. But most of the aphids um, in the UK will lay their eggs on plants which have lots of aphids because the larvae are aphid predators. So similar to uh, ladybirds, you can find, you can sometimes find aphid larvae, oh sorry, hoverfly larvae crawling around the stems of plants such as roses um, and eating, hover, um, eating aphids. What's cool is that um, if an aphid feels threatened, it will send a chemical warning signal out to the other aphids around it. Um, but as you can see here, some aphid, uh, some hoverfly larvae pick up the aphid and hold it in the air away from the stem of the plant. So um, any chemicals that it's sending out don't get transmitted to its neighbouring aphids. Uh, so it's a bit gruesome for the aphids, but the hoverfly larvae can eat can happily eat away at the aphids without the rest of its food running away from it. It's a very cool behaviour. We've got um, this Volicella zonaria, this hornet mimic hoverfly again. And there are a group of hoverflies, including this one, which live, uh, which lay their eggs inside a wasp's nest. So not only does this, um, this species look like a hornet, but it also smells like one as well. It's got the same sort of chemical signature that wasps or hornets will have. So it can sneak into a hornet's nest or a wasp's nest and lay and she'll lay her eggs inside the nest. And then the larvae will um, eat lots of the detritus and lots of all the sort of dead bits of wasp that fall to the bottom of the wasp nest um, and sort of help to clear it up. Uh, the larvae sometimes eat some of the wasp larvae as well. And then you get um, hoverflies, a group of hoverflies with semi-aquatic larval stage. And these in my hand, these are the larvae. Um, they're commonly called rat-tailed maggots, but if you want their sort of PR spin on that, um, you can also call them long-tailed larvae. And these, these species live in wet conditions, often very boggy conditions. So these, this long tail is um, actually 
a, the breathing tube of these larvae. And it's a telescopic breathing tube that extends out from the larva's bottom and it uses it like a snorkel. So it puts the end of its tail, the end of its um, breathing tube at the surface of the water. Um, so it can, it holds it there and then the rest of its body will swim around in the water and feed. So they'll eat things like um, lots of bacteria. But they'll also sometimes eat uh, dead animal and plant matter. And these, these uh, larvae have been used in forensics as well. So if you've got, if you find a dead body with the presence of these long-tailed larvae, you can tell that this is evidence that at some point uh, that body was submerged in water. So, but in the wild, these long-tailed larvae will be found in bogs, in tree rot holes, or sometimes at the edges of ponds, especially if the pond is starting to silt over. They like it when there's, it's sort of very packed with lots of vegetation, and lots of things rotting down, so that there's lots of bacteria in the water. Unfortunately, lots of these habitats, like these boggy conditions, aren't really found in gardens um, or tidy green spaces. Um, and hopefully there aren't too many decomposing dead bodies submerged in water. So unfortunately, there aren't too many habitats for this group of hoverflies to lay their eggs. So the Hoverfly Lagoons project was set up to um, as a citizen science project to get volunteers from across the UK to create these hoverfly lagoons, these habitats, these egg laying habitats for um, the, these group of hoverflies to be able to lay their eggs. And then this is a really great project because uh, volunteers can then check the lagoons, check this habitat for the presence of um, the larvae and the pupae and count how many there are. So you can get really hands-on and um, see the whole life cycle up close. So essentially, this is just a, any old container, uh, such as a milk bottle cut in half with four, like, well, with four drainage holes drilled or uh, poked through about an inch below the surface of the, uh, the brim of the container. And that's just so that water can drain out from the sides and you get a dry layer of vegetation on top. Most of the container is filled with, is packed with lots of vegetation. This can be dried grass, um, grass cuttings, bits of wood, leaves, or like nettles or any sort of weeds that you have um, and filled up with water. So that, that area will be perfect for the larvae to swim around in and feed, but it also gets really smelly, um, which is great because that's what attracts the female hoverflies to lay their to lay their eggs there. The top layer has got um, dry leaves, so all the water will be draining out from the sides. So the top stays relatively dry, and that makes it a great landing pad for female hoverflies to land and lay her eggs. And then when the larvae feed and grow bigger and bigger, they'll crawl out of the lagoons and these sticks help them to climb out um, and they'll fall into this pupation tray. So this is just a tray, a large tray with drainage holes in the bottom and filled with lots of dry leaves. And that's a perfect space for the pupae to hide and camouflage because the pupae look quite brown. Um, like here at the bottom of this picture, and they'll camouflage really well with the leaves. And then as part of the project, the volunteers will um, count the number of larvae and the number of pupae, but you can also collect some of the pupae, um, the pupae in a jar with holes in the lid. So when the adult emerges, you can identify it before releasing it back into the wild. Um, and this is a really fun stage as well, because when the adults have emerged, they tend to be a bit drowsy. So you can hold them on your fingers and they'll crawl around your hand for a bit before flying away. So this is 
as I said, it's a really fun project, especially if you've got children because um, it's very hands on. It's a bit messy and a bit smelly, but you get to see the whole life cycle. And it also has revealed uh, lots of new things about hoverflies, such as um, this this species, this fly here is called Ringia rostrata. And this species, we didn't know its full life cycle. We didn't have evidence of its um, of where it laid its eggs. But one of these was found emerging from the pupae of, um, of someone's hoverfly lagoon. Um, so we found something new about these hoverflies, which is really amazing. And citizen science is great for things like that. Having lots of volunteers all collecting data is a great way to reveal new things. So um, yeah, thank you for watching um, and tuning in. Um, I hope you've learned something new about hoverflies and I hope you go away always looking at um, a hoverfly's eyes to check if it's male or female. <laughs> Thanks very much. OK, thank you, Charlie. That was great. That was really interesting and really informative. I'm just trying to get you on screen now. So while we're waiting for any questions to come through, um, I had a couple of questions. <laughs> um, so um, uh, do you have a favourite species of hoverfly? And what um, it? Yeah, so that um, that hornet mimic hoverfly, Bolicella zonaria, is one of my favourites. Um, they're just very large and uh, lovely to see. Um, I also like the Batman hoverfly because they've got a they're quite an easy species to identify. And there's a species called the marmalade hoverfly as well, which um, is probably one of our more common hoverflies. Um, and that's a very easy one to spot as well. It's got sort of, um, it's probably better to look at a picture, but it's got sort of moustache shapes on its abdomen, um, yeah. which is quite a nice, a nice way to identify those. Yeah. And, um... As I was asking that, Fiona also sent in that question, so I'm glad I <laughs> read their mind. Nice. But um, yeah, I like the uh, belted one. Said, are they called belted hoverflies? Ones that are black, but are sort of almost see-through through the middle. Quite big, chunky ones. I don't know yes, if that's actually yeah. their name or if that's just the name that the person who pointed them out to me called them. <laughs> but, um, I think I think they've got a few different common names. It's a bit mm. confusing sometimes with flies. Yeah, they, um, they're sort of under a like understudied, so they've got sort of lots of different common names or they don't have any yeah. common names. Um, so yeah, and I'm, I'm terrible with Latin. I've got to get better at my Latin names so because <laughs> it causes all this confusion. Um, I was also wondering what's the best place in the Royal Parks to see hoverflies, do you reckon? Ooh, that's a good question. It probably varies from park to park, obviously. But Yeah, um, and there are lots of like different species, like different habitats, so um, there are lots of different places which would be good for hoverflies. There's, um, in Bushy Park, there's woodland gardens and um, I've seen lots of like, hoverflies around there. Um, there's belted hoverflies, I've seen a lot around there, sort of in the woodlands and around the water there. Um, in Hyde Park, I've seen a lot um, in the trees outside the old police house. Um, yeah, but I mean, lots of places, woodlands uh, tend to be really good for hoverflies when there's an opening and lots of sunlight coming through. Um, that's quite easy to sort of spot them sort of hovering around. They tend to hover at head height. Mm. And they quite, do they, is it true they like cow parsley because it's a kind of flat, maybe not all species, but I'd heard that cow parsley is quite good for hoverflies. Yeah, yeah, hoverflies tend to like sort of flat, open flowers. So yeah, cow parsley is good um, and sort of the daisy family mm. are all very good for hoverflies. Um, somebody's asked, do any live in the ground like mining bees? Um, not as adults, I don't think, but um, some will lay their eggs in the ground and um, the larvae will live in the ground. Um, so often around rotting wood, I think when it's sort of very sort of wet rot, 
um, sort of like porridge consistency. Um, I think that's a good sort of consistency and habitat for lots of hoverfly larvae. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and there's there's some, is it hoverflies where there's a species that only lays its, um, its larvae only live in pools of water in old trees? Or is that a different, have I got confused with that? Yeah, I think um, the Scottish pine hoverfly is mm. like really rare. It only lays its eggs in like pine tree rot holes. Wow, yeah. Yeah, it's very specific. Um, so somebody's asked, where in the garden should you site a hoverfly lagoon? Oh, good question. Um, anywhere where it's sort of sheltered. Um, you don't want it sort of in full sunlight because it will sort of dry out a bit. Um, but where it's sort of shady um, and covered. I found when I've made them um, somewhere where cats and foxes don't go to because sometimes um, they get sort of investigated and maybe knocked over. Um, that's been my, my biggest problem with um, creating these hoverfly lagoons. All right, it's good advice. And we've had a question, can they overwinter as adults? Um, they tend to overwinter as larvae or pupae. I don't think there are any hoverflies that overwinter as adults. Um, there are a few species of other fly that, that definitely will overwinter as um, adults. Okay, and um, Fiona has asked, what sort of plants could I pop into my garden to encourage hoverflies? So we mentioned a bit um, of parsley and things, but yeah. Yeah, so any sort of open flowers where they can sort of crawl all over because they've got um, short proboscis, proboscis seeds, it's the plural of proboscis, um, they've got short sort of mouth parts. Um, so they like things that are sort of flat and um, open for them um, and where the sort of the nectar isn't too deep. Um, Would so dandelions yeah. be good? Yeah, dandelions are great. Um, yeah. yeah, anything in the sort of daisy family. And um, somebody has asked, do any migrate like butterflies? Yes, yeah, there's loads that migrate. Um, oh. Yeah, there are ones that fly all the way to like Africa um, each year. And actually there was a, so the FSC Biolinks did a talk all about insect migration and especially hoverflies. Um, and that's on YouTube, that was really good. Um, someone called Will Hawks. Uh, he studies insects and especially hoverfly migration. Oh yes, yeah, so people should definitely look that up. I'll, um, I can email a link to that out afterwards. Um, oh, more questions coming in. Um, do they eat anything else other than pollen? Um, yes, yeah, so they drink nectar and uh, they might eat a bit of pollen. I think that's all they eat um, as adults. Obviously as larvae they'll eat lots of different things like aphids and bits of dead vegetation. Um, yeah, I think I think that's all they eat as um, adults. They they might go for like sugary liquids, um, sort of like honey if they can sort of find it if they're sort of feeling weak. I think they get most of their energy from from flowers. Okay, and um, Fiona's just said that she's got plenty of dandelions, so that'd be a good uh, garden for hoverflies. Okay, so I'll give people a little bit longer just to see if there's any more questions coming in. But just while we're waiting, I'm going to, um, so Charlie's collected some useful links um, and I will send these in an email as well, but I'm just going to pop them in the chat. Um, if anybody wants to, is really keen and wants to check them out this evening. Um, so there is a list of links that should have just gone out in the chat. Um, oh, and somebody has asked, can a lagoon be set up any time of year? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it can be set up any time of year. Um, I'd say around now is the perfect time to set up a lagoon. Um, that means that by the time hoverflies are 
a lot of hoverflies will be ready to lay their eggs. Um, the lagoon will be nice and smelly um, and nice and attractive for the female hoverflies. They're not too smelly, I should say. <laughs> um, but yeah, now would be the sort of perfect time. Um, towards the end of the year, you might have to wait sort of a few months before anything arrives in it. Um, so yeah, I would say now, um, in the next few months, now would be a great time to set up a lagoon. Cool. And somebody has asked, are they a major food source for birds? Yeah, they will. They will be eaten by. Um, birds, they, I mean, they try to avoid it, obviously. Um, and they've got yeah the warning colours um, to, to try and deter birds, but there'd definitely be birds that do eat them. Um, and as larvae, they're a great food source for lots of birds um, and frogs. Frogs will eat them a lot. Um, and sort of beetles and larger invertebrates will eat the larvae. Um, and spiders eat them a lot as well. Oh yeah, I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, you do, you see them in spider webs quite a lot, don't you? Yeah, and I think crab spiders, because the crab spiders can sort of camouflage quite nicely on a flower and they'll sort uh, of, yeah, of course. Um, catch hoverflies when they're visiting flowers. Okay, okay, well the stream of questions is starting to quiet down now, but um, if any else comes through, I'll quickly pass them on as well. But mostly I want to say thank you so much for a really brilliant talk. Um, that was really, really interesting. Um, loads of really good information and hopefully lots of people are going to go away and set up a hoverfly lagoon now. Um, oh, somebody wanted to know, Excellent. can the larvae survive drought? Um, I think they can survive for a little bit without water. Um, yeah, I, I don't think they'll survive very long in a drought. Um, they do need water they like they do need very wet habitats to sort of find their food um they're very sort of sort of thin skinned so i think they would dry out very quickly um without water mm. yeah that's a good question yeah because yeah there's some species where larvae can just sort of desiccate themselves and yeah but not not hoverflies probably that's more um sort of shrimping things isn't it but uh yeah okay well Unless any more questions come in, I think we might be done. But thank you so much for that uh, again, because um, and thank you everybody who tuned in. And um, as I said, this has been recorded, so I'll send the link out as well. And those uh, that list of interesting books and links that um, Charlie put together for us is in the chat. But I'll also send that as an um, I'll also send that as an email, and I'll try and find the link to that hoverfly talk from BioLinks as well. Um, so that I'll send that out either tomorrow afternoon or next week um, because we're out planting more mission invertebrate flowers with volunteers tomorrow. So um, uh, so I might not be in the office to do it until next week. But um, yeah, thank you so much, Charlie, and thank you everybody who um, tuned in. And we've had some thanks coming in the chat saying thanks for all this amazing info. So um, that's great. And there'll be information about our next talk. We'll go out in our newsletter which um, the next one will be. They're, they've gone to monthly now rather than fortnightly because um, volunteering starting back up again and we're getting busier. But the next newsletter will go out at the start of May and that'll have information about our next talk. So thank you very much, Charlie, and thank you everybody else. Yeah, thank you for tuning in. Have a good evening.